So as guitar players, we are led to believe that the pursuit of tone can be a very expensive pursuit. Now, it's very easy to feel like if you're not getting the results you want from the things that you already own, that you need to go out and buy the latest shiny thing that is all of a sudden gonna solve all of your problems. But the reality is, you can probably fix a lot of your problems by understanding the gear that you already own a little bit more. In my own personal journey, I can attest to the fact that I have spent countless amounts of money on new gear to try and obtain some sort of tones in my head that I thought I couldn't achieve with what I already had. And it was only going back and actually learning to understand what I did already own where I really kind of unlocked the tonal secrets that we're all kind of chasing. Now, I've been playing guitar for over 20 years and I've been working in a professional capacity in the industry for somewhere around about 10 years now. I was semi-pro for many years while juggling a regular job and then turned it into a full-time job. Now, in that time, I have been a guitar teacher. I've played in a huge range of bands. I've toured a lot. I have made a lot of YouTube videos. I've done studio sessions. I've done live sessions. I've done a ton of different stuff. And obviously, in all of those jobs, you're always trying to sound the best you can sound. So it was through these jobs and through these different experiences that I've had that I've learned different ways to get great results from my gear, whatever that gear is. Whether it's gear I'm taking to a gig personally, or sometimes if you're touring, you might show up at a venue and there's gear already there, the rented backline or a venue backline that you have to use. And you kind of need to know how to dial in your sound with those things. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you seven tips that I use on a regular basis to get the best tones possible from the gear that's put in front of me. This video today is brought to you in partnership with musicradar.com. All of the things I talk about in this video are also included in an article which is linked down below in the description. So if you wanna read up more detail about all the things we talk about today, you can hit that link and it'll take you over to the Music Radar website where you can read that full article. So I'm gonna be using quite a simple guitar rig today just to demonstrate this point. I'm gonna be using my PJD St. John Standard, and I'm also gonna be using the TC Electronics Combo Deluxe 65, which I'm running out of the cab sim output. So that's modeling a Celestian speaker. That's like a Fender Deluxe Reverb sort of amp in a box. And I've got the Wampler Gear Box dual overdrive pedal as well that I'll also be using. Now I'm keeping it simple because I'm kind of just replicating an amp with a couple of channels here, but obviously you can use these principles going forward with other things as well. If you're using more complex rigs, if you're adding effects to this, all of these principles still apply. So for the first couple of principles, I wanna start right here at the guitar. Now, how we choose to set up our instruments is a big part in how we play and the sounds that we're able to create. Now, some of these things I'm gonna talk about over the first couple of tips are gonna give you subtle and minor tonal changes, but that will add up in the big picture when you actually dial in your amp and you dial in everything else. These things will all kind of fit together in the big way. Now, with the guitar side of things, I'm a big believer in the guitar needs to feel right. And in order to sound good, it needs to feel good. So I can play any guitar that's put in front of me, and I'm pretty sure most of you guys can as well. But when you get handed a guitar that is dialed in the way you like it to be, all of a sudden your ability level kind of goes up a little bit more. When the guitar is dialed in that way, it just helps you kind of feel and sound more like yourself. So getting these first few steps right actually helps your overall tone because these things will make a tonal difference, but they will not, you know, fix any tonal problems. They will just help you feel more comfortable, which in turn will allow you to sound more like yourself. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is string gauge. Now I've always used 10 gauge strings. Since the day I, pretty much changed my first set of strings. I've been an Ernie Ball string player, and for the longest time, I used the 10 to 46 set of regular slinkies. Now, I'm currently using these 10 to 48 ultra slinkies. So, for me, on my journey, I realized quite early on that I'm quite a heavy picker. So, in having the extra kind of mass on the lower strings, it just brings out a little more fullness in the lower strings when I'm attacking them because I do play quite hard. So your string gauge can make a tonal difference. So the general consensus around string gauge is that if you use thinner gauge strings, your guitar will sound slightly thinner, and if you use thicker gauge strings, you'll have a fatter sound. So there's plenty of arguments for and against this online, and it's completely up to you which side of that you sit on. But in my opinion, string gauge matters from a playing perspective because, like I said earlier, if it feels good, it'll sound good because you'll be more inspired to play the right way 
and it will just kind of help you. So for me, 10 to 48 is a great set. I would recommend trying out a few different sets of strings when you're trying to find your tone because you want the guitar to feel right and that will allow you to sound better as you go along. So try and find the right set of strings that suit your playing and your playing style. The second thing I want to talk about is guitar picks. Now guitar picks are often overlooked when it comes to tone, but they do make quite a big difference. Now, much like strings, I have always used the same guitar picks pretty much since I started playing. I've always used these Jim Dunlop Tortex 1.14 mil picks, which these days Dunlop are kind enough to make with my name on the back. But I've always used these picks because, quite simply, since I first tried one when I was very young, they just felt right. And they felt balanced, they felt comfortable. But guitar picks come in all different shapes and sizes. And the thickness of your pick not only affects how you play, kind of like your string gauge, but there is a slight tonal change as well. So I like these picks because I find them to be very balanced. <laughs> And I like a pick that doesn't have too much flex in it. But if I pick up something like this pick, which is very thin, this is a kind of a cheaper guitar pick from a company called Venom. I'm not even sure you can still buy these these days. I must have had this pick for probably 20 something years, but this is very, very thin. You can bend it very easily. I'm not sure what the exact thickness is, but when I strum with this one, we're gonna get a much twangier tone with a lot less bottom end. <laughs> So I find thin picks great for strumming on acoustic. I don't tend to gig with them, but I do like them for acoustic. You can also get nylon picks, and here is another Dunlop pick that is very, very thin, and it's made from nylon. It's very, very flexible, but it does have a nice thumb grip on it. This is a great strumming pick. So you can hear in those three picks alone, there's quite a big difference. If I go back to my main Tortex pick. Now to the Thin Venom pick. And the Nylon pick. So your pick thickness and material is also going to make a big difference. And that's actually a really cheap way to try out a bunch of different tonal ideas because picks are quite affordable. And the third thing is the guitar setup. So there's a couple of different things we can talk about here. So the most important one probably is your pickup height. Now, when you're playing guitar, all of the sound is transferred through your pickups. So when you have a guitar with multiple pickups like this one, this has two pickups. The goal is that when you use your pickup switch, you get a balanced output in all the positions. So to balance the pickups, obviously you need to adjust the height so that the volume is the same. Now you can also get some slight tonal changes. If you have a bridge humbucker that's quite hot and you maybe don't want it to sound as hot, what you can do is you can actually loosen the screws to drop it down into the body slightly. That will increase the distance between the pickup and the strings, and then that will kind of reduce the output slightly. So that's a really good way if your pickup is kind of clipping or you want it to be a bit cleaner, you can reduce the height and that will just give you that slightly cleaner, more open sound. Again, if you have a pickup that's quite low output and you want a little bit more kick, you can do the opposite thing and bring it closer to the strings and it will pick up a more direct sound from the strings, which will obviously cut a little bit more. That in turn can also give you a little bit more top end, but it's very important that you balance your pickups. So if you adjust one, play in the different positions. So in this, it would be like, check my bridge pickup, check my neck pickup. I wanna make sure they're both the same volume. I don't want a drastic drop when I switch to my neck pickup. If I've brought this one closer to the strings, I should bring this one closer to the strings so that the volume is the same. The same is true for string action. So your string action is how high the strings are off the fretboard. So string action, again, really is about feel. It's how the strings feel under your fingers. And, you know, if it feels good, you're going to play better. But there, are, again, are some tonal differences. I tend to play with a slightly higher action because I find it takes a little bit of the additional snap out that I perhaps don't like. I find it gives me a little bit of a rounder sound. Now, I've seen plenty of guitar players who profess that playing with a lower action gives you a little bit more attack because the strings are kind of a little bit closer and you kind of get a bit more almost rattle off the frets, which can translate to a little bit more high end. This is especially popular with funk players because you get a little bit more snappiness out of the chords. 
I personally like my action slightly on the higher side, but again, you can easily adjust that with the bridge of your guitar and try different things there. This can also impact what I said about the pickups because in moving the action, you're changing the string heights, so you're actually moving the strings further away or closer to the pickups at the same time. So in the same way moving the pickups has that effect, so does the string action. All right, now we're gonna talk about some playing stuff. So once you've got your guitar ready, the next thing is your amp. So whatever amp you're plugging into, whether it's one you own or whether you're you know, showing up at a gig and using a house backline or a rented backline, you need to know how to set it up. So the first thing I always do whenever I get a new amp is like I've got this amp simulator set up here. The EQ is on five across the board. I always find that setting everything at five is kind of the amp's most neutral point. If you're ever in doubt, that's usually a good place to start with the EQ. What you don't want to do is you don't want to start with a really extreme EQ. So let's just say I go and do something crazy like this. This is just all mid-range now and no lows or highs. Quite muddy sounding because there's not really a lot of other kind of EQ content in there. Whereas if I set this back to everything being on halfway like I started with, we'll actually have quite a good starting point for our toe. So that's how I always like to start with an amp. Once you've got the basic EQ dialed in, so just set it at neutral, listen to it, try your different pickup positions like I did there, and just kind of listen to the sounds that you're hearing. Then you can start to tweak the amp to taste. So the way I like to move an amp is I actually like to scoop the mids just slightly. So maybe bring them down to about four, maybe three and a half. And I add a little bit more top end and a little bit more low end. So I like that slight pushed low and high, especially when I'm playing in the middle position on a guitar like this. Once you've got that dialed in, then you can start stacking your pedals on top and, you know, fine tuning with your pedals. Because I think having a good kind of core clean amp sound is the best place to start. And then if you add a drive pedal on top like this. It's only a low gain drive, but it's enough push there just to kind of take it over the edge of breakup. I don't really need to change the EQ on the drive because I'm already happy with the EQ on the amp. If I go back to that quite extreme setting, let me just do something completely different here in terms of extreme. And it's going to give you this sound. So a very scooped sound. Then I turn on the drive. That's not really the way I'd want it to sound. Where I hear this sitting perfectly is the way that I set my amp. Because that's my kind of desired tone. So you want to also avoid any kind of extreme EQ movements when you're setting up an amp. Don't set things either, you know, on zero or 10, unless that's a specific sound you're looking for. Try to avoid doing that. Start at midnight, subtly move everything either way to find your kind of sweet spot, then bring your other pedals in. If in this position I thought my drive was a bit too bright, I would then use the tone on the drive to balance this with the amp sound that I'm already happy with. I think getting this right is the core and then we can kind of stack everything else on top. So the fifth thing I want to talk about is also related to EQing and this is really just understanding how mid-range works. So mid-range is very important especially if you're going to be in a band. If you want to play live mid-range is really the thing that you want to have on your side because mid-range is what's going to help you cut through on stage. If you think about the EQ spectrum of a live band the low end really is kind of occupied by the bass drum and the bass guitar. Uh, if you've got a keyboard as well, they might be sitting in some of that region. The extreme highs on stage, you really want to reserve for the cymbals. Maybe some of what your vocalist is doing, if they've got a particularly high voice, they might kind of sit in some of those higher frequencies. 
So the guitar really needs to live in the mid-range because there's not much else on stage that sits in that mid-range pocket. So what, what you don't want to do, even though I do it slightly, you don't want to scoop out your mids. You don't want to take all your mids out because what will happen is this will happen. So if I take the mids out of the amp and also on the higher gain side of the drive, this happens. I have a drive sound, but it has no character to it. And you can almost feel like, even though I'm just playing on my own, the sound kind of disappears. If I bring that mid-range back in, all of a sudden... brings the sound back to the forefront. You can even then boost the mids and that will help you cut through even more. Boosting the mids will fill your guitar tone out in the right way without it being too harsh and abrasive. If you boost your treble to try and cut through, you're gonna be adding those harsher frequencies. So use that mid range to your advantage as a guitar player. You don't wanna go full tilt with the mid-range and end up with this kind of sound. Okay, bad example because for the record that actually didn't sound too bad. But as a general rule, you don't want to go extreme, like I said. You don't want to add all the mid-range, but use that mid-range control to your advantage. Find that sweet spot where you just kind of cut through the mix. And it should sound good in all your pickup positions as well because you've already fine-tuned the EQ. So yeah, that mid-range, very important if you want to play in a band. Once you've got your amps EQ dialed in, the other thing you can think about is mic placement. Now, this is only really going to affect you if you're playing live or in the studio where you're going to be micing up an amp. You're probably not going to be micing up an amp if you're just playing at home. So with mic placement, the mic type you choose is obviously going to be important. Certain mics will have certain characteristics. But let's just say you only have one mic and you need to get the best results from it. The placement is also very important. Now, the most neutral point is the center of the speaker cone. So if your mic is pointing directly at that center point, you're going to get everything. So that's the most kind of direct sound you can get. So we can think of mic placement in two ways, moving side to side and back and forth. So as we go away from that central point, we reduce some of the higher frequencies and we get some lower frequencies. So if you've got a really bright amp sound, move the mic slightly off center and it'll just take some of the edge off. Then we can think about the distance from the speaker cone. So the closer the microphone is to the speaker, the more direct the sound is gonna be because there's nothing around it. It's the mic and the speaker, they're right next to each other. If you want some air in your sound, bring that back slightly. That will soften the whole sound. It'll soften some of the EQ peaks. So if you've got quite a bright sound, it'll take some of the top end off. But what you're doing by bringing the mic away from the speaker is you're letting some of the room in. So you get a bit more of a natural sound. I personally like to, when I'm micing up an amp, I like to set it maybe like, you know, two or three inches from the speaker because it allows some air to come in. But if you're in the studio and you want to capture a super direct sound, you get right up to that speaker grill. So the great thing with adjusting the mic placement is you don't need to buy a hundred new mics. You can literally use the mic you've already got, move it to side to side to find your sort of EQ point, and then back and forth to get the right amount of directness or kind of space into your sound as well. Moving the mic is an invaluable thing because if your amp is set great, but your mic is in the wrong place, you're still not gonna be happy with the sound. So once this is dialed in, get that mic in the right place. There's no right or wrong answer. Find the point that works for your sound. And the final thing that I wanna talk about is using too much gain. Now this is something all guitar players do at some point. I've done this loads of times in the past myself. When you're playing live or when you're recording, it's really easy to crank up that gain because obviously playing with high gain makes everything feel a little spongier, feel a little nicer. But from a live perspective or a recording perspective, it's actually not the best thing for your tone. Because if you're playing at bedroom volumes, playing with really high gain can sound great. But when you take that out into the open world and you play on stage at a you know gig volume or in the studio, using too much gain just makes your tone muddy. So if I crank the gain on both sides of this pedal and I turn it on, 
This might sound okay, and it might feel good to play, but it's going to be quite messy sounding. There's not going to be much clarity to the notes. <laughs> So that feels quite nice to play because it's quite spongy, but that is quite a muddy tone. Now where you're better off with gain is you're actually better off using two lower gain sounds and stacking them up. So that's why a dual overdrive is great because we can do that, but you can replicate this with two individual overdrive pedals as well, or with an overdriven amp and another pedal in front of it. So if I just have one side with a lower gain, <laughs> That already is much clearer, but it's not quite enough gain because I want a bit more. I'm going to use the other side of the pedal, again with less gain dialed in, and I'm going to stack them. That gives me that thick rock sound I want, but without the muddiness, because I'm not pushing the gain up full, I'm just taking one gain, which is actually this one, the lower one, and I'm adding another one on top, which is this, together, the order in which you stack pedals can also affect the tone, so currently this side of the pedal is going into this side, so let's hypothetically imagine this is two different pedals, on this pedal, I can flip the switch and it changes the order. Now this side is going into this side. It's still a great sound, a different sound, but still a great sound without that muddiness. So just bring your game back a little bit. You'd be surprised how much clarity you can open up. And stacking gain is a great way to unlock heavier sounds without the muddiness of one single gain thing absolutely done. So there you go, there are seven tips that I've learned in my career on how to get the best out of any gear you're using and how to improve your tone. I hope some of these help you guys improve your tone and get you out of any tonal ruts that you're stuck in. If you have any tone saving tips you'd like to share with the viewers as well, throw them down below in the comments because I'd love to see what you guys are doing to get the best out of your gear as well. Like I said earlier, don't forget to check out that link down below in the description for the article over on the Music Radar website where you can read up about all this in more detail as well. Don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe button. I'll see you guys very soon. Thank you so much for watching.